Hello and welcome to this video where we'll explore um, developing our first program in Julia. The idea for this is that we will again set up a new folder. We go to open folder and we go into our Julia workspace, the Julia tutorial, and we'll call this session two. And in session, we'll open session two and we'll call we'll open a new file let's we can there's multiple ways of doing this we can go here file new text file new file or we can click here on plus and then just give it a name and we'll call this main.jl because this is the main file of our program and the idea is that we are trying to go for a game the game that i've just explained to you in the previous video and the idea behind this is that I'll demonstrate to you how to go from an idea of a program to a full realization of the program. I have not programmed this before, so you'll see live how I will struggle with this. And I hope this is instructive in a way of letting you know there is some frustration involved while programming and that solving some of these problems requires you to use Google and to look for help online. And the, the way that I would approach this is that I would first write down what I want to do. And I would write this as a comment. And you can write a comment by using the hash or pound or um, gate symbol. And this is a comment. So even if I now would run this file, I would click on play, you would see that nothing will happen it will load the Julia terminal and I can do something here like evaluate the expression 14. But nothing will happen if I run the comment because comments are not executable. So this is a game, a basic card game as a realization in Julia. And the idea is what are what are the basic ideas we will have um maybe 32 cards each card represents a car a car uh cars have different properties um let's we will add the list later and we will have two players uh players will play individual games against one another. The player with no cards remaining will lose the game. So this is a basic description. Obviously, it's not complete. And the idea is just to remind myself what I'm doing here and maybe put it into more clear instructions in how this is done. Um, the other idea here is that I'll show you how to write a program. And the idea of the previous video mainly was that a program or an algorithm, as it's called more abstractly, is basically similar to a game where you have different rules and different decisions that can be made at every individual point. And this game is kind of suited for explaining many of the features that we need in Julia. So the first thing that we are going to need is probably we want to see who loses or wins the game. So we are going to need maybe two players. Um, so we'll have a player one and we'll have a player two. Um, and maybe we're interested in keeping track of how many times these players have won, like who's the better player if we try different strategies. So we could store something like wins, um, wins player one. And this is a convention in Julia to write everything in small letters. So we're not using capital letters, we're using small letters if we're using a so called variable. And in here, we could store something like this player has won zero times. Um, because they haven't played yet. In the beginning, everyone has zero wins. So we call this wins player two is also zero. And we can now run this and nothing will happen except it will store in this variable, 
which we can, by the way, if we go to the Julia environment, we this is if if there's Julia active, you can now see the Julia REPL and will give you the variables that are stored in memory. So wins player one is zero, wins player two is zero. Additionally, you see that zero was outputted here. And the reason is that the result of the last line executed is always printed to the console and setting a variable to a number will result in that number. And you can also by hovering this see that wins player two is a int 64 behind the two um, colons we see in 64 which is the data type it's a 64-bit integer variable and the value of this variable we have this here as well and the ANS the last answer printed out on the on the terminal is also stored as a variable um, in this workspace so what is an integer 64 a computer stores variables in different ways depending on what type of data we want to store. We could have, the player could have a name. So we could do name player one and a name we would typically store by putting them into quotation marks. And we would call maybe this guy um, Adam and the second player name player two could be Bob. Well, let's call this one Alice and then we're in a terminology that you might see more frequently in other uh, computer science exercises. And if we now run this, by the way, this little um, light bulb here tells us there's information if I click on that, and it here says rewrite as raw string. This is a way of improving the code sometimes, not always. And in this case, if I hover the name player one, it tells me that this is a string. So these are characters. So it is stored as an A, an L, an I, as a C, and an E. And all of them are underneath, obviously stored as zeros and ones. That's how computers work. And depending on what zeros and ones you use, they, are, they encode for a letter, in this case for the letter A, in this case for the letter L. And obviously you can use these numbers to encode numbers as well, but the same number, if it is interpreted as a string, can be two different things. So in this case, for example, the, the number 64, if I interpreted this as a string, it would be the letter A, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it depends on the data type, so the type that is used, how this is interpreted. Here we have a string, here we have an integer. And an integer tells the computer or tells the Julia language that this is a, um, a number that consists of whole numbers. So it's only numbers like zero or 1000, or actually you can write a 1000 like this as well. So using an underscore to make it more readable for, as a, um, uh, a thousand separator, you can go quite large actually. You can do one million, one billion. So these numbers are all integers. What is not an integer is something like 0.05. If I do that, I mean, I can store a half win, which doesn't make a lot of sense in this case. And then Julia tells me that wins player one is a float 64. So any number that has decimals would be considered a floating point. And that's why this is called a float 64 because it's stored in 64 bits, which is because my CPU is a 64 bit computer, which is kind of what modern computers are right now. And, um, yeah, if it's a whole number, it would be an integer, an int64. If it's a number with a floating point, it's a float64. And if it is a string, in this case, it is a string. So if we have a character string, it's a string. And these are the three basic types um, that we are going to need in the beginning. There is a fourth one, and um, that is we call a boolean variable a boolean variable is something that can either be true or false so it's just one bit to be uh, to be precise and it's something like game has ended and i could tell it to be true 
And if I click here, or if I hover here, it will now tell me game has ended is a bool, which is a shorthand for Boolean variable. And this can be either true or false. And by the way, I can execute this single line by pressing shift and enter. And it will only execute the line that I'm on. And it will move the cursor to the next row. So you can execute your program from top to bottom by continuously pressing shift and enter. And then you will get a, a printout for every result in every line. But you can still call press this play button here and you'll just see the result down here. If, for example, game has ended, if I uh, if if this variable is false and I in the next line, I can overwrite this variable now. If I put a four in here, then game has ended now is a four and in 64. The variable is now reassigned a new type. It's actually a new variable. It just has the same name. So there is no way of ensuring that this is a certain data type in Julia, at least not for us right now. It's just that the type of variable changes if you assign it to a different type. You can kind of make sure that it is a bool, for example, by putting two colons here. And this was not the correct syntax. Can I set type for global games? Okay, it already has a value. Okay, what, what I did now is um, by I wrote typically this is the way how you would assign it a data type and it should stick with that data type but here it is not possible if I hover over this error it tells me cannot set type for global game has ended it already has a value or is already set to a different type so I cannot assign a type because it is at the moment it has the value four and now I cannot set it to a type if I do game has ended false and if I now assign it a type, one of those conditions is no longer true. So, um, no, wait, I didn't want to hover. I want to hover over the error message and it now says cannot set type for global game has ended. It already has a value or it is already set to a different type. So it already has a value. And when it has a value, I cannot assign it a type. I can, um, what I could do to make this work is by uh, restarting the Julia REPL. So if I re the program is kind of still active, right? The variables are still there and I can overwrite them and it's it's waiting for new commands. But if I close this REPL, which I can do by clicking on this trash can here, I will kill this terminal. Now it has ended. And if I now press on play, it will start from top to bottom. And I now don't get a problem because um, the variable game has ended did not exist before. So when I assign it a data type, the first time it is called, then it's not a problem. And I cannot reassign it to a different type now. So if I now do in 64, this will give me an error. If I assign it to bool, this does not give me an error because it's already in the type bool and it has been assigned to this type in the beginning. So these are our players. What we also need is cards for our individual cars. So the idea is that for every car, let's call this car name. Maybe our car is called a Mustang. And now it has some properties that could be on the car. It could have something like top speed. And obviously the top speed, if I were to we're in Europe, so I'll use kilometers per hour. If it were 200 kilometers per hour, this is the way it would print on the card. But I do want to compare if one car is faster than another. And if I compare a string, it will do a so-called lexicographical comparison, which will check whether one of those strings is prior to the other in alphabetical ordering. And the two is before all the letters because it's a number. So this would always be before Mustang. But um, this is not what we want. We want to actually have a number in here so we can compare the numbers. Top speed would be 200. Maybe you would have something like mileage per gallon. Um, let's call it liters per kilometer uh, and say maybe it uses six. Well, that's optimistic. Um, Maybe it also has something like how many horsepowers does it have? Let's say maybe 180. And I'm making this up. I'm not a cars guy, obviously. Uh, these games didn't really 
help to make me a cars person in the long run. Um, so we have top speed, liters per kilometers, maybe horsepower. Um, maybe we could do range, how far it can go. Let's put this to 550. We can do weight, which could be in this case, I don't know, 800 kilograms. Um, and we can have one of those weird things like how many cylinders does it have? Let's make this an eight cylinder engine. So this could be the information for one car. And let's call this the Mustang fantasy car that I just made up. And I can now set up these variables. And obviously, if player one gets this car, then there must be a second car. And let's do, I don't know, a, a small car, maybe a Mini Cooper. And the problem is now, if I put this here as car name, I could to Mini Cooper, but obviously this is the same variable. So if I run this whole program, car name is now Mini Cooper. So we would have a second car and we could, I mean, an easy way would be car name two, but then we'll have to name car name three and four and five. We'll have a lot of variables and that's not really what we want to do. We want to have maybe a thing how we put these things together and to make sure that we only need one variable for the whole thing so, so that we don't need several of these variables. And what we actually want here is we want a structure. This is a data structure. Every car should have the same properties. It's like a template for all of the cars, which is why we want to do a struct. Let's call this struct car. And it's customary to give structures a capitalized letter and do end here. So this is where the structure ends and we would move all this inwards. And now we should have a car error, error syntax car name equals to inside is reserved around um, line 23. Oh, do we have to do begin? I'm not sure. No. Incomplete syntax struct. So this is what sometimes happens because obviously you forget uh, because you haven't been using the language for a while. And one thing that you could do is you can look it up in the documentation. So let's do here struct. No results found. So let's go to Google and do Julia struct. It is called types. And if I scroll down, um, let's see where they do the struct definition, abstract types, that is not what we want. Primitive types, that's, it says struct, the name and end. And what we see here is that we don't assign them, assign the variables any values, which makes sense because it's a template, we're not giving it a value. So we, a, a, a car has a name, and it doesn't have a car name, but it doesn't have by definition this value that we came up with here. So I would remove all these. And now if I remove the begin, I should have a struct. And I can now create a car by giving it the parameters that we just deleted. Mustang, I can give it a top speed of 200 eight liters per kilometer. Actually, that's liters per 100 kilometers, I guess. It has horsepower of 150, a range of 550, weight of 800 and eight cylinders. And what you also see is that if I have if I put in not enough of these parameters, it will give me this blue squiggly line telling me that something is not wrong. Possible method call error argument six of six and call to car. So there's a problem and it will fix if I add an eight here. So this now gives me a car with the name Mustang, uh, 208 and so on. What is interesting is here we, we expect name to be a string and we expect the other things to not be a string. Uh, we expect them to be a number, but in this case, if I, if I wrap this in parenth in quotation marks, this will also work. 
this will give me 150 as a string. So if we want to make sure that these are numbers, we should make sure that we give the data types for the struct. So the name, that should be a string. The top speed, let's think about this. What is the top speed? Is it a whole number as in an integer or is it a number that has a decimal point? And I'm not sure, so let's make it a float. 64, this should definitely be a float, 64. Um, horsepower, I would guess that could be a float. I'm not sure, I'm no cars guy. The range, probably a float. The weight, could be a float. The amount of cylinders that a car has, that's no float. That's probably an integer because we can have half cylinders. and. If I type in int, you now see in the autocomplete, it actually allows me to do 128-bit integer, 16-bit integer, 32, and so on. In this case, I'm expecting that no car has more than 255 um, cylinders, which is the biggest number for int 8. So this would actually suffice. I could just use int 8 because it's not going to be above that. And if I redefine the car like that, I will get an error because it says error invalid redefinition of type car and the reason for that is because we've already used it. If you redefine a data type and that's one of the ideas in Julia is that types cannot be redefined uh, because they make sure that the rest of the program that is based on this type works, you will have to restart your, um, your Julia session. And now I get a different error and it says cannot convert an object of type string to an object of type float. You don't know where this error is coming from, but I can show you where it's coming from by executing all the lines individually. And if I do this, here it will give me the method error. And it says cannot convert an object of type string to an object of type float. And error messages are a little bit complicated. And um, if you see something like this, if you cannot convert something from one, one type to another, it means you have supplied a wrong type somewhere, which it cannot automatically convert. And the reason is, in this case, this is the name, this is top speed, this is, well, let me leave me alone with that, this is the LPK, and this would be horsepower. 150 horsepower is supplied as a string, and that's, in reality, it should be a float, but it's not possible to convert a string to a float directly automatically because uh, I could put in this and then this cannot translate. So if you want to have a numeric type, you have to give it a numeric type. It can convert this integer. This is actually an integer, 150 without a decimal is an integer, but it can convert this integer to a float automatically because it's easy to do. You really can convert a whole number to a decimal number by just adding 0 0.0 to it. And that's what it does in the background. So this should now work. And now I have a car Mustang, which has these properties. And I can do another car, which would be a Mini Cooper, which has a top speed of, let's say, 180. It has maybe 7 liters per 100 kilometers. It has 120 horsepower, I don't know, range maybe 600, a weight maybe 500, and it has six cylinders. And now I have this Mini Cooper card, which is the second card. So I can create new cars or new cards for my deck by calling this individual line and giving it the parameters that I need. And obviously these are now lost. These are these are printed here, but we don't have them anywhere here. So there's no car in here. So we would have to store them in a variable. So this would be car one and this would be car two. Let's actually call it car one. And if I do this, now I get the car as a struct and I can click on this little arrow here and it will give me all of the information that is stored inside of that car one and inside of that car two. And if now I want to know what's the name of car one, I can just type in car one dot 
name and it will give me Mustang. And if I want to know what's its range, I can see now this is the range. So in a game, if player one had the first car and player two had the second car, then it would be player one's job to identify um, which of his properties is probably better than the property of the second car. So let's imagine he would always, we'll, we'll pick a simple strategy that will always pick the top speed. So let's call the strategy top speed player, or top speed player. So what he would do is he would see if is my car dot top speed is that bigger than car two top speed. And this is how we would compare if one speed is bigger than another or if one speed is smaller than another. And if we want to see if something is equal, then we have to use two equal signs because that differentiates the is this equal from set car one car one to this variable. So one equal sign is setting a variable, two equal signs is comparing a variable. And let's see is car one is player one's top speed higher than uh, car two top speed. Car has no field top speed. Oh, top seed, that doesn't work. I should probably call this top speed and not top seed. And this is true. So in this case, player one would get that card. Hi, this is Future Me, and the video that I recorded turned out to be pretty long, and it doesn't make sense to force you to look through a very long video without having time to um, think about what you've been doing. So I'm splitting the video into three or maybe four parts, and this is the end of the first part. So. If you're confused uh, in the first few seconds of the next part, um, you can have a look at the end of this video so you know where we'll, up, where we'll start, but I'll probably edit in the first few seconds of the last video as a short summary so you see where we're up to. And this video will end here. Um, try to make sure that you've been um, following along and trying to understand what I've been doing. And if not, you can always ask questions in uh, on our website and we'll we'll be glad to help you with that